Is this microphone on? Can you hear me okay? Brilliant. Thanks for making me feel old. <laughs> Honestly. I'm also old. So I come so all of this way, and now I feel like some kind of, I don't know, decrepit relic. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks very much for coming. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. Thanks to Chris and everybody for the invitation. Um, I've been to Singapore dozens of times, uh, but this is the only time that I've ever left the airport. <laughs> it's, um, Singapore's a lot bigger than I'd experienced before. So, uh, yeah. Last year, I, I actually moved from the UK down to uh, Sydney. I took over at, as head of design at a company called Ansarada. And... Uh, we're actually making some really um, exciting designs that are a kind of combination of uh, kind of editorial and um, product work. We're actually building our design and development team, so if you are interested in Sydney, then, uh, then send me an email or send me a, a, a tweet. And I also consult at my own company, do designs for clients, uh, stuff for nonsense. This is our new design this week, meet Errol, my new gorilla. And uh, our goal for the past 20 years has always been to make distinctive, creative work for the web. Work that kind of goes beyond just making a digital product or a, a website easy to use. Because to me, design is much more than just problem solving. You know, it's about communication, it's about inspiring brand loyalty and encouraging affinity. Um, and that's why you'll meet Errol on the website, you don't see pictures of me. Um, and a good deal of my work over the years has involved designing systems and pattern libraries and style guides. Worked for clients like Greenpeace and, uh, and WWF. And style guides, these tools have become incredibly fashionable. You know, we've got articles, um, talks, even entire conferences like Clarity in San Francisco that have been devoted to them. And perhaps the most well-known design methodology um, today is Brad Frost's atomic design. I bet there's very few people that have uh, not heard of atomic web design. Uh, Brad wrote a book about atomic web design. He was uh, kind enough to uh, mention me in the acknowledgements. He said um, to Andy Clark, who's been talking about design systems and atoms before it was the hip thing to do, thank you for all your writing and thinking, but you're still not getting my dog. Which, uh, which is a real shame, actually, because my, my Instagram feed is full of pictures of Brad's dog, Ziggy, um, <laughs> and other people's babies. I'm not sure that's normal um, and that's because in 2012 oh my god that's such a long time ago before atomic design I introduced this idea of designing atoms and elements and it's this process that separates what I call the atmosphere of a design uh, from the layout and uh, if you fast forward to today we'll find that Style guide has become this umbrella term for several different types of design documentation. You know, they might be static PDF style or visual identity guidelines. They illustrate how a brand should be presented and how those assets should get used across different media. Uh, this is a, an example from Audi which uh, includes how to use their fonts and colours and their logo. I'll come back to Audi a little bit later, because I'm hoping that if I mention them twice, they'll send me a free one. <laughs> Chris, can you just pass my water, please? Cheers. So, voice and tone guidelines, they describe how a, a brand's personality should get conveyed through the way that it speaks to customers. A MailChimp's voice and tone uh, is a fabulous, really well-known example of how to imbue a brand's personality um, through the language that they use. Front-end code guidelines for developers, they stipulate coding standards to encourage better collaboration across teams. I'm sure we've all seen examples like this. This is IBM's carbon design system. 
And then finally, component or pattern libraries which commonly contain examples of how to style uh, the atoms and molecules and organisms and templates that Brad Frost talked about in Atomic Web Design. This is from the Guardian's Paste Up, and it's a typical example of uh, a pattern library that's been developed for developers by developers. And in my work, and I suspect in most of yours, when we talk about a style guide, um, we mean a combination of visual identity guides and a component or pattern library. And these all offer something slightly different. Um, but more often than not, they all have something in common. Can you guess what that is? They all look ugly enough to have been designed by someone who really enjoys configuring a router. <laughs> or router, depending on which part of the world you're in. Yeah, okay, that, that was a bit mean, because an unattractive style guide is not going to be a problem for everyone. I mean, people say, as long as it contains the information that people need, how it matters shouldn't look. Or should it? You know, this means that, here's the thing, right? Beauty complements functionality. It doesn't detract from it. Creative design enhances someone's uh, engagement with the style guide, and it should amplify the content. And that means to be effective, a style guide should present that content in appealing and engaging ways. And recently, Interest in design systems has meant that we've had reproductions of corporate design manuals. These have become really popular. This one's from British Rail. I ordered mine online, and it came late. <laughs> <laughs> the NASA Graphic Standards Manual describes the design of everything from a business card to the branding on a booster rocket. Um, you've got the New York City Transit Authority Graphic Standards Manual. It includes the most comprehensive guide to how to use Helvetica that I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Finally, this is a mouthful. The official symbol of the American Revolution Bicentennial Graphic Standards Manual um, explains not only how this symbol should be used, but also how it was created. This is important. I'm going to come back to this later. And now there are collections of design guidelines online, including this one, which includes work from Apple and IBM and Microsoft. The problem with uninspiring style guides is that not everyone needs to take the same information from them. You know, if you're looking for markup and styles to code up some form of media component, you're probably going to be a techie type. But if you need to understand the balance of type sizes across a typographic hierarchy, you're more likely to be creative. So what you need from a style guide is different, and yet so many style guides follow the same patterns. The slides aren't broken, by the way. That's intentionally blank. It's OK? It's intentionally blank because I like to fuck with the AV guys. Right. So, I'm actually going to start off by looking at colour, which to me is one of the most important ingredients in a design, because it, it communicates enough, enough. It communicates personality and creates mood, and it's vital to an interactive, uh, understandable vocabulary. OK, so now it actually has stopped. Oh, here we go. Right, no, 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 we were OK. So you'd think, right, if we talk about colour, you'd think that style guides would present colour in any number of really imaginative ways, right? But you'd be really disappointed because generally the most inspiring you'll find looks like a collection of paint chips from a DIY paint chart. This is Lonely Planet's Rizzo. It does a great job of separating design elements from UI components, but you're going to struggle to get a feeling for Lonely Planet's design just by looking at those colour chips. This is Greenpeace's worldwide style guide. It uses the same approach as the Sky's old web toolkit and the Times' functional palette. 
Um, Gov.uk, gov.uk, have you heard of this website? It's not well known for its creative flair. Um, it varies the approach by using circles, which I find really strange because circles don't feature anywhere else in the branding or the design. On the plus side, though, the designers have provided some context um, by categorizing uh, colors like links and text and backgrounds, that kind of thing. Uh, Google's material design offers uh, an embarrassment of colors. Um, most helpfully, though, it does... Um, advise people how to combine these primary and accent colours uh, into usable palettes. But few style guides actually offer explanations, and even less in the way of inspiring examples. Most are extremely vague when they describe colour. I love this. Um, use colour as a presentation element for either decorative purposes or to convey information. The government of Canada's web experience toolkit states, rather obviously. <laughs> um, apparently, I didn't know this. We can say this inside Microsoft. I can't say this inside Adobe. But adding more colours to their palette has apparently made Adobe a rich, dynamic, and multi-dimensional company. Who knew it was that easy? <laughs> I'm not sure at all what makes the draft US web standards guideline colours a distinctly American palette, but it's going to have to work bloody hard to achieve its goal of communicating warmth and trustworthiness after a year of fucking Donald Trump. <laughs> We're going to build a great style guide. <laughs> People won't believe it. <laughs> It's going to be so great. <laughs> Mexico is going to pay for it. <laughs> right, the University of Oxford is much more helpful. They explain how and why to use their colours. They say in a uh, British accent, um, the dark Oxford blue is used primarily in general page furniture, such as the backgrounds on the header and footer. Beautiful. The designers are open table. They've considered how to explain the hierarchy of the colours that they use by presenting them and the supporting colours in different size chips. So it's really obvious which are the primary and supporting and accent or neutral colours. They don't have to say so. Um, Foursquare. Uh, they helpfully prescribe the percentages of colours that make up their marketing materials. Um, but there are much more imaginative ways that we can describe colour. I love this. This is Steel Toolmaker's brand book, which itself is a really good example of thoughtful graphic design. It could not be clearer when it says, use this colour with this colour. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. You know, it presents its information clearly, and it's in a way which is consistent with this no-nonsense steel brand. The designers at Alberta's Corporate Identity Manual, they cleverly combine colours with imagery of the uh, region that inspires them. And these larger blocks of colour give people a stronger feeling for the design without making um, it difficult to find information about those colours. You know, finally, a style guide should demonstrate the interplay of colour and typography, just to make sure that... Um, people understand what's acceptable in terms of colour contrast and accessibility. So for some companies, organisations, brand books have developed into a bit of an art form. Um, if you find these things as inspiring as I do, it's important to remember that we shouldn't just simply uh, copy the appearance. What we should do is to turn this inspiration into designs that work for the web. You know, for example, this page from the, Gar uh, from the Barbican's brand book to me suggests things like SVG shapes and CSS blend modes, all that cool stuff. Uh, this is the distinctive uh, Macmillan Cancer Support visual identity, and they've brought the design uh, to every page of their brand guidelines. You know, their colour chips match the style. Um, and we get a much better understanding of their visual identity when those same colours are used in other kind of imaginative 
imaginative ways. You know, of course, living style guides and pattern libraries, they need to present information about color values, but this is such a fabulous opportunity to be creative. You know, perhaps we could design some kind of uh, interactive UI that helps people in different audiences get the information that they need. This is the Royal Mail which is one of Britain's most recognisable brands. I managed to leave Brexit Island just after Christmas. I had to put on a French accent to get across the border. In fact, when I put on a French accent, they basically asked me to leave, which was fine. You didn't mention Brexit in the introduction. This was... Yeah, honestly, don't get me started. I think I got myself started. Um, this is a page from the Royal Mail's brand book, and it's really effective because it brings colour and iconography and typography together into this single page that gives us an immediate, immediate impression of the brand. You know, what's more iconic than a van? Uh, colour chips can be used in other kind of imaginative ways to present colour information. You know, they don't have to be rectangular. Um, if you fill playful shapes with colours, you can better connect them with a brand. Um, this is the designer, designers of the, uh, the frozen yoghurt. Did you say yoghurt or yoghurt here? Yeah, yoghurt. <laughs> yoghurt it is. You say what you want. Yoghurt. Yoghurt. Yoghurt fruz. They did exactly that. What they did was that they don't just explain their colours, they tastefully display them. <laughs> inside these silhouetted tubs of frozen yoghurt. Um, and this conveys personality as well as colour information. You know, style guides can make a bigger impression when they have personality. This is a page from, uh, from Bing's design guidelines. And again, it brings colour and typography, graphic styles and their logo together to describe how um, Bing's visual identity system is constructed. So I think that style guides should inspire people as well as to inform those who use them. And I was keeping that in mind when I designed um, a series of what I call inspired guide design templates. And these are style guide templates that I th hope are as beautiful as they are functional. And I made six sets of these things. Um, and they all contain pages of design principles and colours and logos and typography and form elements and buttons. All of the stuff that you would normally put into a pattern library or a style guide. And CSS custom properties. I was going to drop some CSS in here at some point. These now have really, really excellent browser support. And they're fabulous for using inside style guides because they make it so quick to make colour changes um, across different pages and make it so quick and simple. And if you don't want to use Node.js or NPM or any other complicated solutions to get in the way of, a, uh, of making a style guide, you, know, you can just make these things with a good dose of semantic HTML and some plain old CSS, SVG, possibly a little bit of native JavaScript whatever that is. <laughs> you know, you should not need a framework. People always say, well, you know, can I use this thing with Bootstrap? You shouldn't need a framework or any particular software or tool set to make a living style guide. You know, what we should be doing is removing as many dependencies as we can. And, you know, if we want to improve the way in which we present colour inside style guides, there's plenty that we can do. You know, for a start, we needn't confine color information just to the color palette page in a style guide. You know, finding imaginative ways to display color across different pages and then show it in context with all the other parts of the design, that can be really effective. This is a six different cover pages um, that I packed with color. Yeah, they make a really bold statement. You know, a visual hierarchy can be easier to understand than just labelling colours as primary or supporting. So we should find creative ways to display that hierarchy. You know, you might use palette, uh, panels of different sizes, um, or you might arrange boxes on a modular grid and then fill that whole page with colour. 
You know, don't limit yourself to rectangular shapes. We can use circles or we can use other shapes that are just made with CSS. And if irregular shapes are part of our brand, then we can fill SVG silhouettes with CSS and then we can wrap text around them using CSS shapes. All really fun stuff. You know, for the style guides that I've designed, I try to go beyond just documenting color and type styles, and I want to describe what they mean visually for the brand. This was a project that I did last year for uh, Sun Life Insurance in the UK. And I described their colors and how to use them across a series of art-directed pages, which reflect the kind of lively personality of the Sun Life brand. And there's information about hex and RGB values and SAS variables um, and when to use these colors for branding or interaction or messaging. You know, it's all there, but it's in a format that I hope will appeal as much to creative as well as technical people. You know, and I included information about color contrast accessibility because, you know, understanding um, why certain combinations of color are inaccessible, that can really reduce testing times. You know, it can avoid a lot of arguments about color choices. And then I try to find distinctive ways to present color that better reflects the brand. So for Sun Life, I made these header graphics um, that really show that their brand personality has a fun side to it. You know, I experimented with ways to communicate color hierarchy through different sizes um, and quantities of their circle device. So, alongside color, typography is probably going to be the most defining aspect of any design. So we're really fortunate uh, now to be able to use any number of uh, different fonts on the web. We're not limited to using fonts that are just installed on a person's device. So you might imagine that with so many beautiful typefaces available, style guide designers would constantly be creating inspiring ways to present these types of typefaces. You know, you'd be disappointed. This is Adobe, again. Even Adobe, they own Typekit, numerous typefaces, but they fail to make the most from the fabulous fonts in their own style guide. You know, most pattern libraries offer documentation, but they don't offer inspiration. You know, while information about type sizes is important, so is the context in which that type is used. The treatment of type at different screen widths and the way that type elements interact with each other is vital to communicating a design. You know, many style guides fail in demonstrating this. Even the best examples, including this uh, gel from Westpac, it only shows a typeface's basic set of characters. It doesn't show the context. It doesn't show any other elements. It doesn't show white space. You know, as it's a publication which is written at, with mostly written content, um, I think it'd be more inspiring and informative to see examples of actual headings. This is from, um, this is from the Times of London, um, instead of this kind of greeting text. You know, people use this quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog because it contains every letter in the English alphabet. But we can use our imaginations to better demonstrate the characteristics of a typeface. You know, over the past few years, I've been rediscovering the work of accomplished art directors and graphic designers. You know, I, I studied fine art. I didn't study graphic design. So, you know, 30, 40 years on, this stuff's all still new to me. You know, learning about this work has convinced me that there's so much more that we can do to communicate our use of type within a style guide. You know, looking at inspiration from other medium, including print, we can learn ways to combine color and typography together to better communicate the spirit of a brand and then how to use those assets. So we'll go back to the, uh, the New York City 
Transit Authority Graphic Standards Manual. You know, it immerses the reader in the details of Helvetica more than any publication that I've ever seen. And it's showcasing not just the letters, but those all-important, often fascinating uh, numerals. Um, and these so often get forgotten when we're making a style guide. You know, when we view characters up close, we can get a much better feel for what gives them their personality. You know, when we illustrate type, we should also explain how those characteristics of size and thickness and weight should then inform the design of other elements on a page, including things like symbols or icons. And understanding how to design typography so that it's legible and readable when we present it light on dark, this is something that's often missing from most of the style guides that I've read. As is how typefaces work in combination with other icons and their symbols. So this is a page from the New York City Graphic Standards Authority Graphic Standards Manual. And it just does this fabulous job of demonstrating how Helvetica's numerals and letters combine to create this design that just feels at home on the New York Metro. And Style Guide should inspire designers by demonstrating other potential applications for typography. This is the NASA Graphic Standards Manual. It does just that. You know, it starts with their iconic logo. And I really, really enjoy how the designers have explained the background to the typefaces they've chosen. You know, I, I know from experience that including explanations like this can really help people to realize um, the importance of good type. You know, these things are not just commodities that come installed with windows. Yeah, NASA demonstrates how to use typography on signage, vehicle livery, you know, and it's important to demonstrate how typography can affect even these most kind of mundane items. These are paper forms from NASA, but they could just easily be a, an email newsletter or a web form. You know, these all benefit from better typographic design. And in a style guide, typography pages can include examples of the cases and the weights, primary and supporting typefaces, information about white space, it should demonstrate how different type treatments should vary when they're presented light on dark. And as a design often includes supporting and uh, primary typefaces, we should devise ways to show the relationships between typefaces. You know, many contain really distinctive, characterful letters or numerals or symbols, so we ought to make space in the style guide to showcase them. You know, rather than overlook those numbers, we should design pages to show when and how and why someone should choose to use numerals for maybe a supporting typeface rather than the primary one. You know, they can be fun. You know, we should find ways to display them as, that are as attractive as they are useful. And to give people a better understanding of how to use them, as well as breaking type down into component parts, you know, it's really important to show the combinations of different type elements. For example, you know, large images with captions. And we should provide this extra context by demonstrating a type element alongside, let's say, a typographic scale, and then provide information about using color at the same time. You know, we can use this process of designing a style guide to kind of expand our repertoire of designs for little elements that often get forgotten, like block quotes and pull quotes. And we can take the opportunity to bring designers and developers together around the style guide to talk about the creative possibilities without sacrificing, let's say, performance or responsiveness. So when I was designing for WWF, I had to think very, very carefully about how to use the typefaces that they'd already chosen. So I started off by making some simple kind of HTML type sheets 
and then I tested them across different devices so that I could understand what the minimum and the maximum sizes should be. And then the style guide that I designed for WWF, it includes these organisms. It even includes full page templates so that it gives the fullest kind of impression of my typographic design. And I took a similar approach when I was designing for Sun Life. This is demonstrating how their vague, rounded typeface, how that sort of personality gets conveyed through interactive UIs. And we've included the modular scale, included information about color. And this Sun Life style guide even includes big, larger organisms, you know, banners and common navigation elements, just to ensure that everything's presented as part of a consistent whole. You know, to be effective, a style guide's typography shouldn't just be reduced to its component parts. We should see typography as an ensemble of type elements that all play their part in a typographic design. Finally, I want to talk about imagery, because graphic icons and graphic images are another important element in the design of a lot of digital products and websites. So let's have a look at how many style guides routinely display this iconography. Um, the Code for America style guide, it presents these icons at different sizes, but the designers at Clear Left, who we saw earlier, um, they haven't explained how the design of these icons should adapt when it, they get reproduced at different sizes. You know, they've also really missed a trick, I think, an opportunity to demonstrate adaptability um, and responsiveness. They could have, you know, built this style guide, for example, using picture elements so that we could see um, what those icons would look like on different device widths. I just, I really wish the designers of the Mapbox style guide had thought just a little bit harder about designing some kind of imaginative interface to make the most of these icons. I don't know, where, do you have your binoculars? Some beautiful icons reproduced, tiny, tiny size. And sadly, Atlassian style guide says absolutely nothing about how to create new icons that match their existing set. This is a, an important omission. You know, meanwhile, over at gov.uk, I've actually found those circles, which we were missing earlier. You know, it's really easy to poke fun. I know that. It's really easy to poke fun, especially at gov.uk. <laughs> um, but it's really hard to get the design of a style guide right because designers and developers need something different from them. You know, developers might need file names and CSS class attribute values. Designers might need to learn how to create new icons um, with the same visual style as the existing ones. You know, satisfying both needs can be really tricky, but the challenge isn't any more difficult than the work that we all do every day. You know, I'm convinced that we can do a lot better. You know, you might feel more than a hint of nostalgia when you look through British Rail's corporate uh, identity manual. Mine arrived late, and now I can only read it standing up. <laughs> British Rail jokes don't go down well in Singapore. <laughs> I'd have them rolling in the aisles if we were in Scunthorpe. Um, you know, it's visual identity, this iconic visual identity, um, extends to the trains, it extends to the uniforms of the people that used to run them. Very attractive, dapper looking chap there. You know, and the best style guides explain the why as well as the how. And this is especially true when it comes to designing things like logo marks or symbols. You know, I'm fascinated as someone that didn't study graphic design as to how these symbols are created. You know, understanding the thinking that goes into designing a symbol can help people appreciate how and then when to use variations of it. You know, this matters now more than ever before, I think, because this symbol can be reproduced at any number of different screen sizes across this whole array of devices. 
And it's especially important when we think about reproducing symbols um, against dark color backgrounds. So color, icons, and type, they should all complement each other within a design. And style guides should really demonstrate how to combine these elements to achieve the most effective result. You know, I really love the precision that's gone into designing this signage. Is it only me who thinks that this is like the best website button you've ever seen? <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, knowing how an icon's been designed goes hand in hand with understanding how to use it. And fully appreciating principles and proportions makes working an icon into a design at the right size and with the right amount of white space around it much, much easier. Of course, not every icon or symbol needs precision. I'm always amused when I, I read that to make the Skype cloud, we can use circles, any size and placement and shape, but make sure it looks cloudish. <laughs> this. You know, for this style guide that I designed for Sun Life, I went beyond simply documenting the icons and tried to use those icons themselves to add personality to the style guide. And with almost all of their style guide pages, this icon page was, you know, thoughtfully uh, art directed. I wanted to include the anatomy of an icon and how to design one with the correct proportions. You know, actually I adjusted the proportions of the circles in the Sun Life logo so that each one was like 75% larger than the one before in the sunrise and then built the grid around that. So it explains how I use those proportions uh, to create a grid that then became the foundation for all these future icon designs. And then I described how to use those same principles to create graphic illustrations so that every graphic illustration, every graphic element has a relationship back to the proportions in the Sun Life logo. And explaining these processes clearly to future designers is really going to help to maintain standards and hopefully consistency. Especially as the collection of these icons and illustrations grows. And I think because it's always better to show something rather than tell, I use those same kind of graphic illustrations right the way across the style guide to bring that to life. So in all of the work that I do, I try to use creative design to improve not only how something looks, but also how effective it is. And style guides should be much more than just guides to a library of patterns. You know, they can inspire people to make better designs. They can teach people the importance of good design and why it's important to keep our standards high. You know, style guides also the perfect place where we can experiment. If you've been aching to try out a new design or layout technique like CSS Grid, you can do that away from the normal constraints of browser support. You know, and I want to stretch expectations about what a style guide that's been developed with HTML and with CSS can look like. You know, I, want to ins I hope to inspire people to learn more about those technologies through the style guide. You know, it's also the perfect, perfect place to document the history of a design. These, these stories often get lost really easily in the fast-paced environment of today's design and development. You know, so instead of showing finished work in the case study, uh, uh, finished work in, uh, as a case study in your portfolio, write about those thought processes, show your design's evolution. This is really important to documenting the history of the web. You know, the best, the best systems are based on a solid set of principles, so it's really, really important that Style Guide explains these well. I promised that I would mention Audi again. Um, they've done what many people haven't yet achieved, and that's make this tool that's as practical for uh, designers as it is for developers. You know, they've really succeeded in letting the soul of their brand shine through in the style guide. I'd like to think we can all learn a lot from that example. Um, design principles are something that Shopify's Polaris describes incredibly well. 
you know, hats off to these guys. I think this Polaris is the best style guide I've seen for the last couple of years. It does a lot of things right. You know, it starts with accessibility. Um, and Polaris makes a really good case for making usability for everyone and building inclusive experiences part of its principles. You know, it's showing really what to do and what not to do. Um, not just documenting a, a set of guidelines, but showing graphic examples. And I suppose because a design system is never finished, Polaris also makes it really easy for people to collaborate on its development. You know, and why not bring those design principles off the screen and into a three-dimensional world? These posters were designed by um, an intern at Salesforce, and now they're everywhere. Um, around the Salesforce organization to remind their people of their design principles every day. You know, you might choose to break the model altogether. You might combine all of these elements of your visual identity and patterns into a single sheet poster for your designers or developers or maybe even third party agencies that you work with to uh, hang up on their wall. You know, the possibilities are really endless. So I hope that I've inspired you to think a little bit more creatively um, about the design of your own style guides and component and pattern libraries. Um, and also why creative design uh, can inspire and inform people better. So thank you very, very much for listening. Unfortunately, we've got a really tight schedule, so we don't have any time for questions. Um, you can